It's been a busy week here at the shop and we've got a lot going on. We're trying to get ready to go to Detroit this weekend for the Detroit Autorama. Vicki and I are planning on riding up together. Tanner and his girlfriend are also going as well as Paul, Nikki, and Jesse from House of Pearls. We're all looking forward to it as long as we can get through the rest of the week and get the work done here at the shop that we need to get done first. Our carpenter friend Dave is out here putting up plywood around the base of the walls in the new shop and he's also been working in the Mersh area, getting it finished up, working on it here and there as he's had time over the last couple of weeks. We've also been busy working on the race car trailer, getting it ready to make a trip to North Carolina, and then of course we've got the El Camino V8 swap project that's not quite going as planned. The 327 I plan to put in the car is pretty sludged up, so Tanner and I plan to bring this 350 in from out back once we make some room in the shop to work on it. I went ahead and fired up the Malibu and backed it outside to let it run for a little while to charge up the battery. It hasn't hardly moved since I brought it back from Jack's Wax after they detailed it. Once we made room in the shop, I fired up the skid loader and picked up the frame with the forks and hauled it up front so that we can pull the engine and transmission out of the frame and then separate the engine from the transmission and then haul everything out of the garage except the engine separately. Although I know this is a good engine, I am skeptical that it's actually a 350. So the first thing I want to do is try and figure out what this thing is because I've never seen a factory 70 SS Nova with a two barrel engine. And even though the car looked all factory and it looked correct, like unmolested, this doesn't add up. That car really should have had an L48, which would have been a three, 300 horsepower 350. And this is a 250 horsepower 350 at best. And it may not even be a 350. Once we had the engine in the shop, I turned my attention to the block casting number and found out that it is indeed not a 350. The casting number comes back to a 307, which is still a far better option than the six cylinder that's currently in the El Camino. Not as desirable as the 327, but for what we're doing, the 307 will work out just fine. So we've got it ready to come up out of the frame. I'll go out and get the skid loader. I'll bring it in. We'll lift the engine and transmission up out of the frame rails and then we'll pick the frame rails up and carry them out and get them out of the way. Is that the plan? Yep. All right. Typically, we would just bolt our lift plate to a four barrel intake and pick the engine up. But since this engine has a two barrel and our lift plate won't bolt to it, we resorted to a chain bolted from one head to the other. Once I had the engine and transmission removed from the shop and set outside, I came back in and picked up the frame to move it out of the way. The next step is to bring the engine and transmission back in the shop and separate one from the other by setting the transmission on a milk crate and removing the bell housing bolts and converter bolts. <laughs> you didn't know your own strength, did you? <laughs> so now we can go ahead and pull the exhaust manifolds off and I'm guessing we'll probably just go ahead and use the short water pump off the 327 because that's what the 65 El Camino would have had as a short pump and keep it somewhat like it should be. And I think it's going to be easier to mount the AC compressor on this with the short pump like we did the 55 Chevy. I could be wrong, but I need to look into that. Um, I want to make sure that we don't destroy the factory fuel line. I don't want anything to happen to that because I want to leave the factory two barrel and the choke and everything on it just like it just like it came. This is just something that's going to be daily drivable, reliable, starts when it's cold, starts when it's hot, the whole thing, you know, yeah, so. New yeah, we're going to need a new carburetor gasket too. That's a mark part. Chumpy, here we come. Now Tanner and I tried a couple of times this morning to get Mark on the phone, but he's evidently pretty busy. Since the weather's so nice today, I figure one or more of his minions have called off work. After all, spring fever here in Ohio is a very real thing. After being cooped up all winter, everybody around here is either eager for the track to open or to get their boat back in the lake. But neither one is likely going to happen if we can't get Mark to answer the phone. So I go in to find out what the hell's going on. Somebody punch you in the eye? Back in May, I had a retina tear, and I had two cataract surgery. Holy shit. You look like Mark's been boxing you back there. Well, you could be here. What in the hell's going on? You got a blind guy out here trying to work the counter. Paint mixing guy is colorblind, and you don't answer the phone. Listen, you got a big problem. My brother now has his own YouTube channel. Well, I saw that. Now, everything that I used to cut out and edit to protect you, no. I'm not going to have. He's going to chuck you under the bus and back over you 
every chance he gets. I would probably have the police on speed dial. I would just about bet he's gonna get thrown out of here. There's no probably about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I need a carburetor gasket. Oh, we got those. I'll bet you don't have this oh, one. Oh, I've got one of those. No, you don't. Yes, I do. You, you do follow not. me right over here. Come here, you come with me, Mr. Cameraman. Are you doing anything right today? Uh, as far as Mark's concerned, no. Okay, well, what are you doing right now? Selling a battery to a guy named Beerball. Beerball is his name? Mm -hmm. Last name, I hope. All right, so we got stuff. Stuff. I gotta find the. I gotta find the the stuff. Yeah, it looks like you got a lot of stuff. We got stuff somewhere. Man, did you shine your head this morning? Naturally shine. He said he has a special box, and I think you're supposed to leave that at home under your bed. Look at that. Oh, Look at that. Looky there. No. He's got two of them. No, he does uh, not. Let me see it. this. Look There's at no that. way. Yeah. That's not the same. Yes, it is. No, it you isn't. Don't, yes, it is the same gasket. No, it's you not. You just don't need that. Look, you don't need this little thing here. Yeah, it's pretty close. No, that's exactly perfect. Told you. Well, this one. doesn't look like as good a quality as what oh, I that, have. that is very, that's probably American made right there. Well, yeah, because it's been here since 1970. You're right, exactly. All so, right, I'll take both of them. All right, you probably should because that's the last two in existence. Probably. Mm -hmm. Well, you bailed yourself out today. Look I don't know how you did it. Uh, I hope that's what I did. Later that evening, we're having a nice, quiet, peaceful night out in the shop. I was busy editing in the merch office while the dogs keep track of Billy and Tanner, who are working in the shop, finishing up some fabrication work on the Falcon. Billy and Tommy have decided that if they can get the Falcon back together, they'd like to take it down to the Nitrous Nationals and test at Shadyside. It's a very good possibility because all they've got left to do is some exhaust work and a little bit of tuning on the engine. Once they had the driver's side exhaust system finished up, they opened the door and fired the Falcon up for the first time to hear it run through the new exhaust and the new turbos. While Billy and Tanner are checking for leaks, I get a text message from a friend of mine in New York. Mr. Tyler Noboost is making a surprise visit. What brings you here? I'm about to take Billy, Billy's fucking trophy. <laughs> <laughs> we going to dinner or what? Yeah, let's go, man. Wait, I want to show him my office first. Oh, yeah. Vickyville. You got to see Vickyville first. Tyler and Joe don't make it out this way very often, so we wanted to go out to dinner and I offered to let them stay the night here at the house and they could drive back to New York tomorrow. It's about a nine hour drive and I figured a little bit of rest would do both of them a lot of good. Well, I'm in trouble. She's out there blowing the horn. I'll be back in a little bit. Unfortunately, Vicki and I both had doctor's appointments Friday morning, just our yearly checkups to renew our medications. Vicky was asking a lot of questions that prolonged our visit, so I asked one of my own to speed up the process. She's been asking about Viagra. Oh, I have <laughs> That got things moving along, but now I've got another situation I've got to deal with. They're gonna mail you a box, and then you put a sample, and then that goes to the mail. We'll have Paige handle it for you. Evidently, now I've got a shit in a box for colon cancer screening, and Vicky wants to pick up lunch for everybody. Can we go back to the house now? I have one more stop, so, when I met Tanner's girlfriend a few weeks ago, I found out she works at a bakery. So it's just up the street. We are going to go scope it out. This is pretty typical for me. Anytime I get trapped in a vehicle with her running errands, I get drug all over town. Super cute place. This time I'm being drug into a bakery. And if I have to endure this, you're going to have to endure it too, because Vicki insisted I take video. You look really happy to see me. <laughs> I have that effect on a lot of people. Tanner Wright's girlfriend, Natalie, was in there this morning working at the bakery, and I could tell she was really enthused about being on camera. But in order to appease my wife, I did as I was told. I've learned over the years, the more I drag my feet and argue, now can we go home? Yes. The longer the process is going to take. Anyway, once we got back to the house, we brought lunch in for everybody, and then I had to answer questions about my doctor's visit. Did you get your bubble finger? No, they told me I got to shit in a box and mail it in. Nah, no way. What we got here? Kane's chicken. Best chicken you ever had. So did you sit in the box? No, they got to mail me a box to shit in. As we're eating lunch right on cue, my favorite sister-in-law showed up. Guess what? I've got a special delivery for you. I get to shit in a box and you got to deal with it. Paige can't wait to retire. After lunch, Tyler wanted to take me for a ride in this 67 Chevelle wagon that he's procured. Powered by a 5.3 LS with a six-speed transmission, I fully expect us to have to walk home, especially with Tyler driving. First time before people. 
it was at this point I start to think back to what my doctor said about my tetanus shots being up to date. I'm pretty sure she said I'm good to go. What do you think, Joe? I actually like it. Do you really? I mean, the cup holders. The cup holders? <laughs> oh, what the hell was that? If I'm going to continue to hang out with Tyler, I need to keep walking shoes on and keep up to date on my meds. Yeah, pull it right out on the track. I would. Pull the rear end right out of this thing. <laughs> With a six-speed transmission, 308 gears, and drum brakes at all four corners, I was thankful that Tyler let out of the gas when he did. Tyler's clearly happy with his latest purchase, and me, Tanner, and Joe were just happy we didn't have to walk home. It was finally time for Tyler and Joe to load up and head back to New York. Be careful. There's something about Tyler's New York accent that June Pup just doesn't care for. Anyway, Tyler and Joe load up a 67 Malibu wagon and start their nine and a half hour drive back to Long Island, New York. Vicki and I, on the other hand, we start getting ready to head north, up to Detroit. Our trip this evening is about a three and a half hour drive one way, according to Vicki and her GPS. Paul, Nikki, and Jesse are already up here, and Tanner and his girlfriend are on their way too. Vicki and I's hotel is up near the airport, a Holiday Inn, about 20 minutes from the car show. We pulled into the hotel at about 11.30, unpacked our bags and got a room. And then I downloaded the Uber app so that we could get an Uber ride first thing Saturday morning instead of driving the dually downtown Detroit. Vicki and I both got up early enough we got to even have breakfast before we left. So we're ready. We've had breakfast. Yep. She's about to take her first Uber ride. Yeah, I hope we got that. When I brought up the app on my phone, Uber gave me three options. I picked the cheapest one of the three, which happened to be a Toyota Prius. The 25 minute ride to the convention center wasn't too bad. And despite how long the line was to get tickets, it took longer for Vicky to find a restroom than it did to get through it. So far so good, right? Right, that wasn't bad, got our tickets. How would you rate your Uber ride? Um, we, you and I, are not cut out for compact cars. Yeah, Other we, than that, it was great. We should have got the Uber Comfort. Yeah. So with a quick pit stop in the restroom for Vicky and our tickets in hand, we make our way inside. Now, it's been quite a few years since I've been to a car show. The closest thing to this in size that I've been to has been PRI. There's one car in particular up here that I'm looking for, and Vicki and I walked around for over an hour in search of it. Now, don't get me wrong, I found some really cool stuff, like this yellow 442 Olds that had been painstakingly restored. And although the car looks stunning under the lights, the details that set this car apart from any other Olds in the world is what lies beneath the hood. The W43 badge on the front fender is the only clue that this is the only Olds Cutlass like it in the world. Under the hood is the only 32 valve 455 experimental engine known to exist. Truly a remarkable car, but not the one I'm looking for. So we have found the Meguiar's Semi. It's the biggest landmark here. <laughs> and I've called in for reinforcements. Tanner's on his way to rescue us. SOS Tanner. Yeah, because I can't find what I'm looking for. <laughs> Tanner and his girlfriend Natalie have come up to visit with her father, who has this rather elaborate screaming yellow 1961 Volkswagen dune buggy on display. Tanner? Yeah. What do you think of the show so far? Tiring. Bill is after what? A 55? Yeah. Okay. Completed 55 over there. That's okay. what I'm looking for. All right, nice. Let's go. Let's go look at that. When the 55 Chevrolets were introduced in 1954, everyone knew they were special. Arguably one of the most beautiful cars ever created, both inside and out. It was a completely brand new car. The all new 1955 Chevrolet was designed from the beginning to appeal to younger customers than what Chevrolet had been attracting in years past. With new options like power steering, power brakes, and factory installed air conditioning, the 55s were a big hit with men and women, both young and old. But the most popular option was the new overhead valve V8. Today we know this engine as the small block Chevy. The combination of the new body style and the new V8 engine option made these cars so popular that the Flint, Michigan assembly plant couldn't build them fast enough. GM ended up selling over 1.7 million 55 Chevrolets. Production for the 55s began in late September, early October 1954. And by mid-November, GM was on track to be the first of the big three Detroit automakers to complete the assembly of their 50 millionth automobile. 
To put this in perspective, Ford wouldn't reach this milestone until 1959, and by the time Chrysler got to the 50 millionth, they didn't even recognize it. General Motors knew they were going to be the first to build 50 million cars, and they intended to let the world know it and never forget it. In November of 1954, Flint, Michigan was preparing to celebrate the arrival of the 50 millionth vehicle produced by General Motors. GM could have built the 50 millionth car as a Cadillac, a Pontiac, a Buick, an Oldsmobile, but ultimately, they chose the 55 Chevrolet. And they literally rolled out the red carpet for everyone to come and see the car be assembled and driven off the assembly line. School shut down for the day, and it's estimated that over 200,000 people joined in to watch the parade Tuesday afternoon, November 23, 1954, after a very special 55 Chevy Bel Air Sport Coupe was assembled at approximately 10.50 a.m. that morning. This very special Bel Air was painted gold with a gold chassis and 24 karat gold-plated trim. Approximately 20 minutes later, the completed 55 Bel Air rolled off the assembly line and the celebration in downtown Flint, Michigan began. There has never been and likely never will be a more highly celebrated brand new car or truck than the Golden 55 Chevy produced by General Motors as their 50 millionth car. The Golden 55 Chevy is arguably one of the most important and iconic vehicles ever produced. And you would think that a car this important, this iconic, would be kept in a safe place in a museum, or at the very least, safely stored away somewhere within the confines of General Motors. But sadly, the story of the Golden 55 ends in tragedy and honestly should be remembered as one of the biggest blunders in General Motors history. For some unknown reason, General Motors sold the Golden 55 to a private owner and the car was lost in a garage fire in 1996. So the original Golden 55 Chevy was lost forever. But thanks to Golden Star Classic Auto Restoration Parts, Real Deal Steel, and Snodgrass Chevy Restoration, this beautiful Golden 55 Chevy stands as a tribute to the Golden 55 Chevy lost so many years ago. You have found the car that you wanted to see. This is the car I'm here to see. The biggest reason I wanted to see this car, I wanted to talk to these people, is because Golden Star uh, sponsored a lot of the parts on this car. The guy who owns Golden Star actually talked to me on the phone about Mom and Dad's 55. Mm -hmm. He was really excited to be part of it. And I told him, I said, listen, I need the absolute best fitting parts I can get my money on, or yeah. I can get my hands on. And he assured me. This is it. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to come up here and talk to these guys for a minute today. Thankfully, I had the opportunity to talk at length with Mike from Snodgrass Chevy Restoration. He explained to me in great detail differences between the early 55s and the later ones, and exactly what to expect as we start the process of restoring my mom and dad's 55 at House of Pearls. We also spoke at length about the details surrounding the build of this particular 55 Chevy, but most importantly, the history behind this car and the three others that would have been lost forever had this car never been built and the investigation of documentation that this build required. Did you even have to ask where I was? <laughs> you do right where I would be? Yeah, we saw the Gold Bel Air. We were like, well, I've got your bills over there. And as we're walking, I see Vicky, her blonde hair. I'm like, yep, there it is. There we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the whole reason I'm here, 100%. Yeah. Like most everyone else who follows 55 Chevy history, I thought there was only one Golden 55. There were three. And Mike from Snodgrass Chevy Restorations took a few minutes to explain to me how they come to this conclusion. So there were three of these cars. Number one, burned up in the fire, and these are remnants of car number one. Number one, and it was fully loaded. Yes, but sir. it was not the 50 millionth car. No, sir. There were three cars they built two prior to the 50 millionth for publicity and photos because they couldn't possibly do it all in one day. Yes, sir. As the 50 millionth car came down the assembly line. Yes, sir. So car number one got away. We don't know how. It's a mystery. Yes, sir. Got sold. It ended up in North Carolina and burnt in a garage fire in 96. Yes, sir. We have no idea where number two is. Yes, sir. And nobody really knows what happened to number three but the real 50 millionth car was likely crushed. In our theory. In I'm your saying, theory. In our theory. Through all the, our, our historians, by doing the deep, deep, deep research, with the lack of some records that was still just never documented back in them days, through all the research and for remnants that we've seen, through certain small, subtle changes in, in black and white pictures, 
that our historians can sit there and prove that there were three cars that put all the pieces together like a puzzle, and this is where we end up. So the 50 millionth, when it came down the line, it was a bare bones. It doesn't even have a radio in it. No, sir. Nope. But they weren't really, I shouldn't say they didn't care, because they had number one that was a fully loaded, if it had that option available that year, it was in that car, number one. Yes, sir. And they probably just planned on putting number one out there for everybody for publicity, and they didn't really care about two or three, even though the third one was technically the 50 millionth car. We believe through, once again, through research, and through the way you diagnose research and, and, and look at everything, our true belief is exactly what you said, Bill, is, is car number one was a Motorama. Hitting all the Motorama shows on the Golden Train, they called it the Golden Car, to get prior publicity way ahead of that true community day of November 23rd. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. After leaving the show Saturday afternoon, I arranged for a team meeting at House of Pearls first thing Monday morning. Well, what did you guys think of the show? It was pretty awesome. Overwhelming, but it was pretty cool. We were only there for a couple hours on Saturday. Um, I just I was trying to enjoy it, but I have so much stuff on my mind. There was a lot of inspiration there, though. There was that, so much amazing yeah. work that it really just pushes us to want to go further yeah. you know yeah. that 65 malibu that you guys worked on was gorgeous Thank you. Yeah. and it, it it took second place in its class yep yep, yep. it got and an it, award for outstanding paint yeah. and then it also got the cassie cup really yep well that's nice that's yeah. pretty cool so did you guys enjoy looking at that 55 bel air that thing was awesome i love gold so yeah Mint condition I love yeah, the gold too. The, all the gold trade. There's so much gold on that that I thought the glass was tinted gold. Yeah. Because yeah. of the reflection of yeah. it. It looked awesome. Oh, that thing was awesome. So this video is a lot of this video is uh directed towards the history of that car. And I didn't know until I got up there there were actually three of those cars. Oh, really? Wow. That's I didn't know that. Three gold? Three gold 55 Chevys and 500 four doors were built uh, and sold through you know a few dealerships. Mm -hmm. But as you guys noticed, it's very difficult to make content or film anything up there with large crowds. Yeah. And GM understood that when they started this process of trying to promote the 50 millionth GM car. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what happened was, I know. So what happened was. They built two Golden 55 Chevys prior to the actual 50 millionth. So the number one car was fully optioned, fully loaded, and it was actually pulled right off the assembly line. It was a coral and gray two-tone Bel Air two-door hardtop, completely repainted, and that was fully loaded. Like, it had every option you could get on it. The second car was basically just used for uh, the body drop video, uh, there was a movie made about the car and the, and the number two car was used for the body drop scene of the, the production that they, the GM put together of the whole process. The 50 millionth car that was actually produced as the 50 millionth car, it literally was just there for that day and it had no options. It didn't even have a radio in it. Is there any of them around still? No. No. So the number one car, which was not technically the 50 millionth car, but the number one car that was pulled off the assembly line somehow mistakenly got sold and it was in a private collection in North Carolina and burnt to the ground in 96. Oh those God. were those burn up parts that were laying there next yeah. to the car. Those were remnants of the number one car. Oh wow. Yes. But the number two and the number three car, they believe they just crushed them. Gotcha. Wow. Because they didn't want anybody to know there was three of them. Yeah. And they didn't really want anybody to know that the number one car wasn't necessarily the real 50 millionth car because it was fully optioned. And that's the car they sent out on the Motorama, uh, the Golden Train. And yeah, yeah. And they sent it all over the country. Yeah. All three cars were just promotional vehicles. They didn't really mean anything to the executives at GM. But like we as car enthusiasts, we're like dedicated to that 50 millionth car. But you got to understand to them, they were all just cars yeah. yeah it was just promotional it was just promotional yeah. Yeah. Sell more of that. right yeah. right and i don't understand it nobody really understands it but somehow they've kept all the milestone cars they were all there that day during the parade uh the day that that car was built all the other milestones the one millionth and 20 millionth and all that they were all there they kept all those but for some reason the 355s <laughs> done Jeez.
That's I've quite interesting. So are you here to tell us that you want to make another gold one? No. No, 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 no. No, not at all. No, we're not doing that. But, uh, you know, I wanted to talk to those guys because, you know, Real Deal Steel, I talked to the owner of Real Deal Steel this morning on the phone, and he provided the body. And Real Deal Steel assembles parts made by Golden Star. They buy the parts from Golden Star, and they assemble those parts on a jig as Real Deal Steel bodies. Gotcha. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. So that's the connection there. And I just wanted to make sure that I understood that entirely accurately before I did the video. Mm -hmm. That's the, the main reason I wanted to go up there and, and talk to those guys and, and learn the history of it and understand that no one knew there were actually three of these cars until Real Deal Steel decided to build the tribute car. Okay. That's when they started looking into all the documentation on the cars and they realized, hey, wait a minute. The number one car had paint dividers because it was originally two-toned. Oh. See, the paint dividers on the rear quarter panels were only on two-toned cars. And it didn't make any sense to the guys trying to figure out what's going on. Why did an all-gold 55 Chevy have mm -hmm. paint dividers? That's why. Because it was two-toned before. Because it was two-toned before. Oh. It was pulled off the assembly line. And then car number two had different variations. And then car number three had different variations that only an experienced person would pick up on. Mm -hmm. But obviously, the car number one being fully loaded had air conditioning, power steering, power brakes, had oh. stereo. You know, everything that you could get on it was in car number one. And that's the one that went on the on the golden train and, and went to all the Motorama shows. That's cool. But... It's, there's a lot of history in that car and building that tribute car that yeah. we would not know today if it weren't for those guys taking the time to build that car the yeah, way yeah. they did. That's pretty awesome. Very cool. So they, the work on that car was perfect, which this one is going to be as close to I, as, close <laughs> as we could possibly do. Um, Listen, this is isn't... Far, everything he was talking about with the gap fitment. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Did he use the same panel, all company? That yes. He did? Golden Star, yeah. Yeah, yeah Golden yeah. Star produced all the sheet metal on that car. Yep. So, awesome. so we're getting ready to get started on this thing. Yep. All finally the sheet got, metals here. Yep. Finally got the inner quarter panels. So this is the last thing we were really waiting on. Jesse wanted to do the quarter panels before the floors because he wants to weld some braces on the floors. Right. So he just didn't want to have to do that on the new ones. Yeah, right. No reason for that. So, yep. Finally got what we needed. Well, we, I'm excited. Probably this week. Oh, really? This yeah. week oh, you're yeah. going to get started on it? We're going to get started. Oh, wow. So we'll see how much awesome. we cut. Update yeah. videos Start for time. you guys. So be Very good. Yep. So make sure you guys, if you want to see firsthand the first glimpse of it, you can subscribe to House of Pearls on YouTube. Yep. Thank and you'll you. get to see yeah, And you'll get to see everything before I see it, really. Yep. <laughs> 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 you're going to get the first stuff. <laughs> no, no, no. That's your content. I want you guys to be able to benefit from it the same as I do. So. Appreciate it. Appreciate it a lot. Well, thank you guys. It was good seeing you guys good up there. Good to see you too. Yeah, yeah it was a fun, fun weekend. <laughs> I'm going to take care of you. Yep. All right, everybody. Welcome back. I'm out here in the shop tonight. I'm going to work on finishing this video up. Uh, this video has taken a lot of time and a lot of effort, uh, but I feel like I owe it uh, to everybody that has some involvement in that project with that 55 Chevy to do the absolute best job that I can do. Uh, even though I'm not a historian, uh, and I was just informed this weekend that there were actually three of those cars, not just one. So I'm learning right along with everybody else here. Whoops, my phone died. Uh, so I had to go in the office and let my phone charge up. And while my phone's charging, I went ahead and cleaned up my dually and brought it in here. I got some work I want to get done on it tomorrow. Uh, so I'm back. <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, a little, little different change in scenery. I just want everybody to understand what's going on. Um, so the, the 55 Chevy thing, like I was saying earlier, you know, I'm learning along with everybody else. Um, just want to give a shout out to everybody that was involved in that project from Real Deal Steel, from uh, Golden Star, from Snodgrass Restoration down in Florida. Amazing job, guys. Uh, amazing job. And... Um, I really, really appreciated the time that you all took to talk to me while I was at the show, and uh, it was very hectic. If I've made any inaccuracies in anything, any of the information I've given, I apologize in advance. Again, I'm not a historian. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, 
an expert in this whatsoever. I am just a very, I would say, an avid enthusiast uh, at best. So I'm really looking forward to going back down to Florida and visiting maybe the guys down there at Snodgrass. I haven't talked to them yet, but I did talk to the guys uh, that owns Real Deal Steel. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the next trip we go to Florida. I'm going to try my best to get down there and visit with everybody. So that's going to do it for tonight, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. And I hope that uh, if you're still watching, I hope you enjoyed and you love the 55 Chevrolet and small block Chevy as much as I do. Good night, everybody. Oh, it's a great day, all right. A salute to Mr. and Mrs. America, to all of us Americans who, as one people, have pioneered and protected the way of life that is the USA, whose courage, confidence, and cooperative accomplishments are proudly symbolized here today by this unparalleled achievement that marks a milestone of progress pointing the way towards still greater things for all of us everywhere to share. secret was teamwork and though doubters and scoffers said this is as far as you'll get